<laughs> okay. So it sounds like the goal today is uh, to uh, put our heads together and try to reduce uh, youth substance use in the community. And so we're, um, I'm told we're starting with uh, trying to start with some good information, some good scientific information, and uh, we'll go from there. We're going to have plenty of time for questions, answer, comments, interactions as we go along. So some, I am a scientist, and so sometimes I forget to speak plain English. So there's going to be plenty of time to slow me down and um, try to clarify things as we go along. This is a slide here, just in terms of whenever we go to scientific conferences, we're supposed to present our real and potential conflicts of interest. And I think that's really important uh, you know, for all presentations, really, because um, nowadays there are a lot of people making a lot of money in this new industry. And so you just want to know where people are coming from. So uh, I do research with the National Institute on Drug Abuse, and Denver Health is my hospital. And then I uh, received a small honorarium for being here today. OK, so, oh boy. So sorry, you were told to turn your cell phones off, right? And the rules right there say turn your electronic devices off. And I'm telling you to keep them on here. Um, towards the end, you'll see why I'm asking you. Actually, I think right now, I'm going to give you guys an opportunity to, um, can people read that? Why are you here today? And this will help me tailor the talk to um, your needs. So um, just because I've made the slides doesn't need to mean I have to follow them super carefully. So text a code to 22333. And uh, let me know why you're here today. And uh, we'll see if technology is our friend today or not. Um, it almost was not our friend when I made it to the airport in Denver yesterday and realized I had left my laptop at home. So uh, <laughs> hopefully today um, we'll, we'll have more um, success with technology than I did last night. We can only choose one option. I've tried to choose two options before, and it blocks you out. It says, you cannot respond to this poll anymore. And um, so, uh, <clears throat> well, good. This will help me here. So it looks like, overwhelmingly, it's you know people work with kids here is the main reason for people's, uh, people being here. And it sounds like in terms of prevention, treatment, um, other things. So that's really helpful for me to know. I appreciate that information. And um, we'll try to tailor the talk to the presentation today to meet your needs. So OK, so when you're talking about marijuana, the politically correct term we're supposed to use now is adult use marijuana. The problem with that is that adult use marijuana really is an oxymoron. So what do I mean, like an oxymoron like sweet misery or something like that? Um, so why is it an oxymoron to say adult use marijuana? Really because these are data from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. And they go into the communities and assess adults and children uh, who are in school, out of school, ask them a ton of questions. In this case, did you use marijuana, yes or no, in the last month? So let me walk you through this here. We have the percent of people who said, yes, I used marijuana in the last month. And we have by age here, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, all the way up to 40 to 44, which is my age group, not for too much longer, but it is still. And um, so you see, what's the peak? What's the peak age? 20, right? Followed by 19, followed by 18. Um, and so you can see here that this young age group disproportionately represented by people who use marijuana. And that's a real complexity because it's the young people who, because of their developing brains, their developing self, social situation, are, who are most vulnerable to the effects of marijuana use. So uh, when we're talking about marijuana, we really do have to include kids and in the youth in the conversation. And so uh, this is a slide here of the brain. And uh, so we're just going to do a little bit of neurobiology. Hopefully you guys can, I won't bore you to tears here. But this is a slice of the brain here. All of these are receptors that marijuana binds to. So 
Um, marijuana binds to something called the CB1 receptor in the brain, the cannabinoid 1 receptor. It's the most common receptor of its type. The density of this receptor peaks in childhood and then decreases thereafter. Why does it peak in childhood? It plays an important role in brain development. So, um, so we'll talk more about that in a second. Some important parts of the brain here. Uh, so this is the brain reward center. Everything that feels pleasurable increases the amount of dopamine in this structure right here, the nucleus accumbens it's called. So whether originally probably designed to respond to food and sex, uh, also drugs uh, can increase the amount of dopamine in that structure right there. So any substance of abuse, whether it's marijuana, alcohol, tobacco, heroin, cocaine, amphetamine, they all increase the amount of dopamine in that structure right there. We have, um, let's see here, the prefrontal cortex that helps us think ahead. So, ooh, is it a good idea to do this, you know, to drive 90 miles an hour in a 25 mile an hour zone? The prefrontal cortex helps us control some of these um, thing, impulses that we may have. Now, this structure right here, fully developed early teenage years, this structure here, the prefrontal cortex, not fully developed until the uh, mid-20s, like early mid-20s or so, 24, 25. So really explaining a lot in terms of why adolescents are more vulnerable to becoming addiction or to becoming addicted. They have a gas pedal, which works great, and then they have a brake that doesn't, it's not fully developed yet. So this is probably part of the explanation why um, Addiction is not something that you wake up in your 50s and say, hey, I'm going to start becoming addicted to something today. No, it's something that really has a pediatric onset. Um, somebody, you know, vast majority of cases, they have to start during their adolescence and then it progresses from there. A uh, couple other things we need to talk about. Hippocampus, really important for learning and memory. Lots of CB1 receptors right there in the hippocampus, and we'll talk more about how marijuana is especially harmful to the development of the hippocampus. Learning and memory right there. Uh, cerebellum, really important for uh, balance, coordination, like, say, things related to driving. So hopefully I'm giving you a flavor of how marijuana, just some of the neurobiology and how that affects learning, memory, driving, things that are associated with marijuana use. So really, I wanted to, as a child psychiatrist, I like to think developmentally. So I was just going to start with uh, the impact of marijuana use in pregnancy, march through to latency age. What's that? That's like uh, 2 to 11 or so, adolescence and then adulthood and the impact of marijuana across the lifespan with a focus on youth. Why? Because as I showed you, it's youth who disproportionately use it and suffer the consequences. But, um, but you know, adults are important too. So, so in utero marijuana exposure, there are now two large uh, cohort studies, longitudinal studies coming from Canada. Um, showing us the impact, the possible impact of marijuana exposure during pregnancy. Now, why is this a big deal? It's a big deal because anywhere from about, probably about 3 to 15 percent of pregnant women use marijuana during pregnancy, depending on the study. As more adults who use marijuana, you have more women of childbearing age who are using marijuana. Um, what percentage of pregnancies are surprised or unplanned? It's about 50, 60 percent. So a lot of pregnant women may be using marijuana and not even knowing that they're pregnant. So um, this is something, I think, low-hanging fruit in terms of prevention, to get the message out there. If you're pregnant, thinking about getting pregnant, marijuana is not a good idea for you. I think is the bottom line of this slide. But basically, why is it a not a good idea? So we know that youth who are exposed to marijuana in the first trimester, why is first trimester important? That's when you're least likely to know you're pregnant. Youth who are exposed to marijuana in the first trimester compared to those not exposed have decreased IQ by five points at age six, increased rates of depression at age 10, significantly increased, about double the rate of depression. Uh, more symptoms of uh, behavioral problems, basically. Hyperactivity, impulsivity, inattention at age 10, 
Then they have about a doubling in their odds of using marijuana as teenagers. So not only does it look like they take a hit neurologically by being exposed in utero, but then they're more likely to expose themselves as adolescents. And we're going to talk about the ramifications of that. And then all of these things causing decreased school achievement by age 14. So, um, so hopefully, again, low-hanging fruit. We need to get the message out there, not for women who are pregnant or thinking about getting pre or trying to get pregnant. Now, obviously, in uh, humans, we can never do the randomized placebo-controlled study, randomizing half of uh, women to marijuana while they're pregnant, half to placebo, and see what happens to the children, right? That's like really unethical. And so it'll never happen. And there's always going to be a shadow of doubt that, well, you can't say that marijuana causes these problems you know, with exposure and pregnancy. And you know, they're pretty much right on that. We'll never have a definitive study. In animals, we can do the definitive study. We can randomize pregnant animals, mice and rats, to marijuana or placebo. And the findings are um, very corroborative, very similar to what we find in humans. So I think that's the bottom line around there. So we had a real kind of a devil of a time getting um, pregnancy warning labels on recreational marijuana. Um, eventually that did go through. There will be a pregnancy warning label. Um, not on medical marijuana yet, though. So um, that's a potential opportunity as well. So if we're marching through here, we're um, going on to latency now, so about age 2 to 11 or so. Uh, so this was a study published in um, JAMA um, Pediatrics, which is a very reputable peer-reviewed medical journal, uh, tracking marijuana exposures at Colorado Children's Hospital pre-post-2009. Now why pre-post-2009? That's when we had our real boom in medical marijuana. The state went from about 5,000 medical marijuana patients to about 120,000 in the course of a year. At one point, we had 3.5% of the entire adult population in the state with a medical marijuana card. And so um, tracking pre-post-2009, there were zero exposures to marijuana, toxic exposures at Colorado Children's Hospital. Pre-2009, there were 14 post-2009. People say, well, you can't overdose on marijuana. There really needs to be a dot, dot, dot unless you're latency age. So eight of those exposures had medical complications serious enough to need to be re admitted to the hospital. Two were admitted to the intensive care unit. Um, the main complication is respiratory failure. So. Um, if, if a latency age, if a toddler, somebody like that, gets in, of that age, gets into an edible or any marijuana, that really is a medical emergency. They should go to the emergency department. So hopefully that's low-hanging fruit as well. Also, um, marijuana, no fooling, marijuana, firearms, pills, all need to be kept locked up away from children. I think as a hopefully low-hanging prevention message, we can get out there about that. People ask about secondhand smoke a fair amount, and there's no hard, hard data on this. All we have right now is a case report that I'm happy to share my slides to, um, we'll figure out a method to do that with the references down below, but there's a case report of a couple in Israel who had a 13-month-old and they had a party while the 13-month-old was asleep in the crib and the adults were smoking marijuana and the 13-month-old didn't wake up in the morning and needed uh, medical attention for respiratory um, failure. So, uh, so I think even the secondhand smoke, whether it's tobacco, whether it's marijuana, really um, children shouldn't be exposed to that either. All right. Uh, right, and so even though we don't have hard data on the impact of secondhand marijuana smoke on youth or anybody really, uh, we do have very good data regarding um, the impact of secondhand tobacco smoke 
and in terms of its causing um, increased ear infections and delaying lung development and respiratory infections on youth. And if you look at, I think we have to use a little bit of common sense here. So let me walk you through this table here. These are uh, data from the Institute of Medicine. And uh, in this column here, you have the, some of the ingredients of marijuana smoke. Here you have some of the ingredients of tobacco smoke. With respect to carbon monoxide, you see, for example, um, it's very similar in their percent carbon monoxide. Uh, carbon dioxide, very similar, ammonia, even a little bit more ammonia and secondhand marijuana smoke, acetaldehyde, these are carcinogens now, acetone, um, very similar, toluene. So I think the bottom line is the ingredients of marijuana sm secondhand smoke, ingredients of tobacco secondhand smoke, very similar. And so um, I think more low hanging fruit, okay, so how are we going to prevent secondhand exposure to youth is an important question that hopefully we'll have time to flesh out today. Okay, uh, so this is more of what I was talking about in terms of brain development and why youth are um, so vulnerable to addiction. So let me walk you through this slide here. And this is pretty new science here. You can see 2008. So up until recently, we used to think the brain was fully developed at age six, boom, you're done. And uh, it is true, it's, it's almost its full weight by age six, but we know there's tremendous brain maturation happening until the early 20s. And so what this slide shows here is how mature the different parts of your brain are. And this is age here. And so the brain reward circuit is here, mature early adolescence, and then it levels off. The prefrontal system, what's that again? Does your hippocampus remember what the prefrontal system is, right? That's important for controlling your impulses. And so that's much slower to develop. So you have this gap here where the, like I said, the gas pedal works great and the brakes are not fully functional yet. And so you see children, they're kind of protected, right? Children have terrible judgment but it's okay because they don't want to go out and have sex and do drugs, right? Um, adults may want to do those things, but they, you know, most of us, some, most of the time, can control our impulses related to that. But adolescence is a very tricky time, even though they look like adults sometimes, their brains, we really have to remember, are not adult brains yet. Really, I think, explains Remember, um, who remembers, for example, Joe Camel cartoon character, right? And that was so appealing to youth, the cartoon advertising. Um, there was a study done in the mid-1990s that 30% um, of three-year-olds could match Joe Camel cartoon to a pack of cigarettes, draw a line from one to the other, and 60% of six-year-olds could do that. So really explaining why the tobacco industry targeted youth so that they could develop their new users who could become addicted, who then could turn into their big profits. So that's the science behind that. More about brain development here. Again, you see this was just 2004. It's a longitudinal study, magnetic resonance imaging of the brain from age five to age 20 here. And um, so blue parts of the brain are mature parts of the brain. So as you can see, the summary basically is the brain matures from the back forward and from the bottom up. So it becomes blue from the back forward and then uh, from the bottom up, as you see here. So where's that brain reward circuit again? The brain reward circuit was kind of bottom right there, right? Where's that prefrontal cortex? It's in front on top. <laughs> so it's the last thing to develop, basically. Um, by s when I say it matures, the brain is um, developing little fat cells around the nerve cells called myelin to make the electrical impulses travel more efficiently. It's also getting rid of connections it no longer needs. It's pruning. So the brain is becoming more efficient. 
The receptor that helps control that brain development is the CB1 receptor, which marijuana binds to directly to produce its effect in the brain. So it really is unfortunate that the very receptor in the brain that's helping to control this brain development process is the receptor that's bound to by marijuana. All right, so all of that is kind of a prelude to adolescence and why it's, this is such an important topic for adolescents. So one in six adolescents who tries marijuana develops an addiction to it. So a couple um, points about that. So the number is one in six for adolescents if you try marijuana for the first time before age 18. The number for if you wait till after you're 18 is about one in 11. So much greater risk for every year. This is basic prevention science here that we can prevent the onset of substance use, whether, whatever substance it is, we buy ourselves a lot of good fortune. I guess there's probably a better way of saying that, but so one in sex, oh, also addiction. Wait, marijuana's not addictive, right? Well, that was kind of, that's a myth out there that we just, we really need to, there's no scientific debate about it anymore, that marijuana causes not just the psychological dependence that other drugs cause, but also the physical dependence. Physical dependence, what do I mean by that? Um, tolerance and withdrawal tend to be the two main symptoms of physical dependence. So tolerance, using more to have the same effect. Withdrawal, heavy users, two-thirds of adolescents in substance treatment for marijuana experience marijuana withdrawal when they stop taking marijuana. And some of the symptoms of that include, let's see here, insomnia, irritability, nausea, weight loss, strange dreams, um, cravings, mild tremor, feeling hot and cold are, you know, at least eight of the symptoms starting about day one or two, lasting for up to two weeks. So really we need, you know, we need to get that information out there. No, no more scientific debate that marijuana is not just physically addictive, uh, but also psychologically addictive. Um, Heavy marijuana exposure in adolescents predicts an eight-point drop in IQ from age 13 to 38. So the story behind that is very interesting. That's a story, that's a study called the Dunedin study. And Dunedin is a little town in New Zealand where they followed over a thousand consecutive births from birth until age 38 with over a 90% follow-up rate, which is amazing. You could just never do that in the United States. People move around too much. Um, so it was a very well-designed study. And they assessed a lot of things. They assessed IQ at age 13, IQ at age 38. So it's supposed to be the same. We're not supposed to get less intelligent as we grow up. It you know, may feel that way, but it's not, that's not supposed to happen. It's supposed to be the same over time unless you've had some toxic exposure or head trauma, something like that. They, in the between time, between age 13 and 38, they looked at what substances people used, uh, they looked at educational achievement, they looked at mental health issues. It was a very nice perspective study this way. Like I said, we can't randomize half adolescents to marijuana, half to placebo, and see which adolescent gets brain damage. Again, it's an unethical study. And so this is the best we're going to get, really, a 38-year uh, you know, prospective study with a great follow-up rate, and you get over 1,000 consecutive births. I mean, this is really about as good as it's going to get. And so what they found was that um, those who had adolescent onset marijuana use, um, progressing to heavy marijuana use, had up to an eight-point drop in IQ from age 13 to 38. <coughs> Now, a couple th more interesting findings about that. The um, decrease in IQ was dose dependent, so the more marijuana they were exposed to, the greater their loss in IQ. Um, those who started using marijuana as adults did not demonstrate a loss in IQ. It was only those who had adolescent onset marijuana use who had the decrease in IQ. They looked at the adolescent onset marijuana users who stopped using marijuana at age 37, 
And so they had a whole year to, or at least by age 37, they had at least a year to um, have their brain return to normal functioning. They still demonstrated a decrease in IQ. So unfortunately, I mean, good news is that it's dose dependent. It's never too late to stop. It's never too late to continue doing damage. Um, but the bad news is, is that it looks like it's permanent. It's a permanent decrease in IQ. And they controlled for mental health issues. They controlled for um, socioeconomic status, educational achievement, all, you know, many possible confounds to this finding here. So very important study there. Uh, Two-fold increased risk of psychosis in adulthood. And so that's a very interesting story there. It started in 1988 with a study of over 40,000 Swedish soldiers. And they found that those who were exposed to marijuana as teenagers compared to those who weren't had about over a four-fold increased risk of developing psychosis as adults. What's psychosis? That's hearing things that aren't there, seeing things that aren't there, having delusions, which are fixed false beliefs the community doesn't share. People at that time thought, that's a strange finding. Marijuana is associated with something, which is associated with something, which then is associated with something. And, uh, but since then, five more studies have confirmed this finding controlling for over 60 possible confounds, such as, well, maybe people were intoxicated with something at follow-up, and so maybe that's why they had psychosis. Or maybe they had psychosis to begin with at baseline, and that's why they had psychosis at follow-up. Those kinds of possible confounds have been controlled for now, and we're left with this very confusing finding of two-fold increased risk of psychosis with adolescent exposure to marijuana. Again, it's dose dependent. So the more marijuana people are exposed to, the greater their risk. This, by, by the way, starts with a single exposure, but then, like I said, is dose dependent. Um, and then one more uh, comment, and then we'll uh, move on to some question answer time. So another longitudinal study here done in Australia daily adolescent marijuana use or cannabis dependence, predicting a doubling in the odds of anxiety disorder in adulthood. So again, um, these are the most robust findings in terms of the mental health consequences, possible consequences of adolescent marijuana exposure. And so just again, driving home the point that there's this developing adolescent brain the very receptor in it that binds to marijuana is the receptor that helps control brain development. What are the possible impacts uh, of adolescent exposure to marijuana? These are some of them here. And uh, after the question and answer, we'll get into that right now. And then after that, we'll talk about some of the social, psychosocial impacts of marijuana use on youth as well. Thank you, Dr. Yes. Gustav. I also wanted to let everyone know that the morning's presentation is being recorded and filmed and we will um, email everyone um, after the presentation to let you know how to access that. I know that people have some questions about sources and that type of thing. So this is the first of three Q&A sessions that we'll have during Dr. Thurstone's morning presentation. You all received note cards in your registration packet and that's so that you can write down questions at any point during the morning's presentation. There are helpful people walking down the aisles. If you can pass the cards to the sides, they will um, bring those cards up to me. I will read them out loud to Dr. Thurston and he'll have a chance to respond. If we don't get to all of them in the first Q&A session, we have uh, more throughout the day, so keep that in mind. While we are gathering note cards, I have a couple questions that were posed this morning before we even started. Uh, the Durango Herald is our local paper, and this morning they reported that teen marijuana use is down in Colorado, according to CDPHE, a recently released study, appearing to debunk theories that legalization would increase youth use. Your thoughts? Right. I guess I'll get into it right now because I was, I was going to get into that in a few slides. But um, just to touch on it now, Yes, so there was um, a, the Colorado Healthy Kids survey came out uh, yesterday, past month marijuana use in Colorado. 
uh, is at 20%. Two years ago, it was 22%. And four years ago, it was 24.8%. And so there's um, been people uh, who have said, see, we need you know, more re regulation works. And we need more marijuana, medical marijuana, and recreational marijuana, because it makes marijuana use among youth go down. It's kind of the argument. And um, I think a couple things. One, I think the take-home point, as I see it, is I, it's irresponsible to make that conclusion that marijuana commercialization, medicalization, uh, legalization leads to decrease marijuana use among youth because, A, this is not a significant, statistically significant drop from 22 to 20 percent. So every poll has its margin of error. And that is within the margin of error, number one. Number two, it's my understanding that this year, Colorado did not achieve a representative sample with the um, Youth Risk Behavior Survey with the CDC. So really, we're comparing apples and oranges. We're comparing two different polls, one that was a representative sample, and then one that was not a representative sample um, this last year in 2013. I think another important thing to remember is that these are 2013 data that we're talking about. And so um, the retail marijuana started in 2014. So we're still talking pre-commercialization of marijuana in Colorado. Um, I think also a couple of important points about this is that this is a survey of kids who are in school. And who are the kids who are most likely to be out of school, not in school? The ones who are using substances. And we know that uh, school expulsions for um, substance use are, um, have really uh, risen dramatically since 2009. Um, so I think there are a lot of confounding factors with that. And it's really um, would be irresponsible to make that conclusion. And I'm going to present some other data on um, youth use. Uh, that I think is more helpful. Yeah. Thank you. We have a lot of great questions here. Um, here's one. Can you speak to the use of marijuana in adolescence and the onset of schizophrenia? OK, so I, can I speak more to the use of uh, marijuana in adolescence and the onset of schizophrenia? So that's basically this slide right here. So it looks like there's a two to four-fold increased risk of marijuana of development of psychosis, which psychosis is a symptom of schizophrenia. Um, and uh, so uh, two to fourfold increased risk of psychosis, schizophrenia with adolescent exposure to marijuana. Um, what can I say else about it? It's dose dependent. Uh, so the more marijuana people are exposed to in adolescence, the greater their risk of psychosis and schiz uh, schizophrenia. And it appears that there might be some youth who, are, who have the, an underlying genetic vulnerability um, in there. It's called the COMT dream, uh, gene, catecholamine methyl transferase gene. And certain youth who have a certain genetic type of that gene um, who are at increased uh, risk tend to, actually, it's over tenfold increased risk of developing psychosis with marijuana exposure as adolescents. Um, so stay tuned with this developing story. What we need to know is the exact mechanism by which it um, precipitates psychosis. Um, anecdotally, it seems, it really feels like we're seeing it more and more. The high potency marijuana actually has been shown to um, contribute more to the development of psychosis. And it seems to be very hard to treat. Doesn't seem to respond to medicines typically in my experience. That's anecdotal. Yes. Is there a link between marijuana use and the prevalence of PTSD in returning troops? Oh, right. Is there a link between uh, marijuana use and the prevalence of PTSD in returning troops? And so the short answer is yes. Uh, people with PTSD, including veterans, um, at greater risk for using marijuana and other substances, alcohol. Um, and I think the bottom line around that is that substance use, including marijuana, the data we have make PTSD